Technology is moving so fast, it's hard for many churches and nonprofits to keep up, especially when it comes to giving. So stay ahead of the curve with Secure Give's 7-in-1 giving system with all new features like auto card updater, cryptocurrency giving, and tap to give kiosks with Apple Pay. And it's all back with their full suite of management tools that enable you to gain insight into your church's giving at a glance. So visit securegive.com slash Stetzer today to get six months of free software to see why SecureGive is the trusted giving solution. That's securegive.com slash Stetzer. Welcome to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast. Conversations with today's top ministry leaders to help you lead better every day. And now, here are your hosts, Ed Stetzer and Daniel Yang. Welcome to the Sessor Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping Christian leaders navigate and lead through the cultural issues of our day. My name is Daniel Yang, the director of the Church Multiplication Institute, and today we're talking with Dr. Ryan Burge. Ryan's an assistant professor of political science and the graduate coordinator at Eastern Illinois University. His research focuses largely on the interaction of religiosity and political behavior, especially in the American context. Ryan's a pastor and the author of The Nuns, where they came from, who they are, and where they're going. And then 20 minutes about religion and politics in America. He is also the main uh, researcher for the book, The Great Dechurching by Michael Graham and Jim Davis, which we interviewed. Make sure you check out their uh, interview with uh, Ed and I at churchleaders.com slash podcast. But before we talk to Ryan, we want to remind you that if you're enjoying our interviews, it would help us if you left us a review, especially on Spotify. Now let's go to Ed Stetzer, Editor-in-Chief of Outreach Magazine and the Dean of the Talbot School of Theology. Okay, so Ryan's going to be our guest, and and we've already... um talk some about the, the book, The Great Dechurching. But we're actually, uh, right now, we're recording. We're, you know, we record on Zoom. Now, now you don't know that when you're listening, because uh, most of you listen via audio, via Spotify, which is where all the people are downloading, it appears, all the cool people. Um, but the uh, the uh, the reason we're right now doing this is we just had Ryan speak at the, at the Evangelism Leaders Fellowship. Andy Cook is my successor here at the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center, and he's gathered together key evangelism leaders, just heard from David Kinnaman, and I'm going to explain David Kinnaman's connection to this conversation as well. Uh, just heard from David Kinnaman, other researchers as well. So good conversation we're having. So we're coming right out of that meeting and 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 uh, the Billy Graham Center hosts the heads of evangelism organizations twice a year uh, here at their uh, at their offices in Wheaton, Illinois. Okay, so that being said, we, we, we already talked some about the great dechurching. We're going to come back to that. We want to talk some about that. But I also want to remind you, or remind you, I want to tell you that this is the launch of a series. Some of you are actually watching this over on on the Faithlytics platform. Let me explain what we're doing. So you may have heard that Glue has um, acquired, brought into the family of resources, uh, Outreach, Outreach Magazine, and this podcast is the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast, which is part of Outreach Magazine. So um, so with that connection between the two, we were actually doing a series called Faithlytics, and Faithlytics is a look at faith with, uh, with analytics, so, you know, with graphs and charts and all that kind of stuff. And so over at the Faithlytics site, which is glue.us slash Faithlytics, just, just as it sounds, glue.us slash Faithlytics, you'll find uh, a series of interviews with researchers. Uh, Ryan's the first one, and then uh, and then Ryan's also the one because we're, we're not going to let him refer to charts and graphs because, because you can't see them. The vast majority of you listen to this as a podcast, but the rest of those interviews are all with charts and graphs. And so so you can't, we're not gonna put them in the feed for the Stetzer Church Leaders podcast. Instead, we're gonna invite you to go over to glue.us slash faithlytics, all free there. Actually, what you also would like too, is that all the charts and graphs are free there. Uh, and you can actually, they're actually created so you can use them when you're maybe talking about religion. We, all that stuff is downloadable in the show notes. So we have Greg Smith from Pew. We got Frank Newport from Gallup. We got David Kinneman uh, from Barna Research. We got Scott McConnell from Lifeway Research. We've got a great conversation with all of them over, five, I think it's five additional episodes in addition to the one we're doing here with Ryan as well. Sorry for the long introduction, but want to make sure you go and get a hold of that resource as well. And in the feed, let's say using the Spotify feed, the only place you will hear this part launching is actually in this episode. Episode one is here connected with Ryan, and we're glad to have Ryan here with us. Okay, Ryan, so we just heard you talk about, well, some of the some of the issues about the current state of the church. You drew some from some of the data in and around uh, the great dechurching and more. Uh, but you, you, I mean, you kept coming back to 
some reasons why, pe why people de-church, they disconnect from the life of the church. Why don't you just start with us telling us, what do you see? Because you also, I should also mention too, that Ryan's written a book uh, called The Rise of the Nuns, which a lot of people have engaged as well. And, uh, and it was just called The Nuns, where they come from, where they are and where they're going. And of course, 20 myths about religion and politics in America and soon it'd be an Oxford University press book. But talk to us a little bit, why are people dropping out of church? Because we all know they are, what's going on? Give us the down low. Yeah, I wish I could say it was because of politics or you know, that a big theological crisis or issues with sexuality or orientation. But the great de-churching, kind of the big takeaway that I tell people like in a nutshell is the biggest reason why people leave church is because they moved. You know, there's very logistical reasons why people leave religion behind. Things like I got married or I got divorced or we had kids or I moved or I took a new job. Those reasons actually are probably more important for the average person than things like politics or religion or Donald Trump or LGBTQ or trans or abortion or anything else. People tend to slowly drift away from religion over time. You know, they go every week for a while, then they go once a month for a while, then they go two or three times uh, a year for a while, then they go, you know, seldom or never after after a while. And they kind of look back and go, I kind of wish I could go back to church. I, I wish I would be back in church, but I really don't feel like I'm missing anything from church. And therefore, I'm not going to go back. So it's not one stochastic event. It's really kind of a slow slide away from religion over a longer period of time. Okay, now, so that reminds us of a couple of things. First, we are talking about de church people. Yep. And of course, you wrote the book on the nuns as well, which I want to commend to people to pick up. It's, it's a helpful look at the nuns. Because um, there are people, we would say, that have rejected things of faith because of their social views, because of their political views, because of their, uh, you know, their understanding of sexuality or, or, or whatever else it may be. Um, but and, and that does exist, though, though, when we're talking about the de church, those who are moving away from church. We're seeing this has to do with maybe an issue of, uh, I don't know, maybe convenience or or a loss of community. Because but here's the thing. I mean, you know, Ryan, you're you're, you're serving as a pastor right now, um, and you're a full time professor, but you're you're pastor in, on the weekend, as we say. I've done that, so I get it. Um, but I mean, isn't a sense that that I mean, there are churches in those other towns, right? So they if they move to another town, it's not just the move. Something was disconnecting them already. Do we know any more about what that might be? Yeah, for a lot of them, they say they don't fit in with their congregation, which obviously can mean five different things, right? Like I don't fit in politically, I don't fit in racially, I don't fit in generationally, I don't fit in theologically. They just felt like religion, for whatever reason, was not a good fit for them. And so, you know, they drift towards, people drift towards places where they fit in, they feel like they belong. And for a lot of people, especially who have kids, you know, travel sports has become a major part of their life. And a lot of travel sports people are, are the same kind of people, educated people, higher income, more mobility. And you want to be around people who are like you. So you want to hang out with travel sports kids. So what's I think what's happening largely is they've found ways to replace religion by picking these different communities that tend to be more like them. When religious communities that used at least used to be more politically diverse, more economically diverse, more educationally diverse, so they're they're gravitating toward these like enclaves where everyone kind of thinks and believes like they do, which is sort of the antithesis of what we want religion to do in in American life and American democracies, bring people together from different backgrounds. Yeah, is I, I wonder, Ryan, um, how much of those who are dechurching, how much of that is connected to? Uh, not just change of like scenery, but change of lifestyle. Is there a particular demographic that you see they tend to de-church? And then amongst the de those who are de-churching, can you think of different categories within the larger category of those who, who leave church? Yeah, so if you really want to see ground zero for the de-churching, I think it's older millennials or younger generation uh, X. You know, those people are kind of, They've had kids now, they've gotten to their 30s, they're trying to figure out what life looks like. And the old model used to be the life cycle effect, which is the idea that people drift away in their 20s and they get married and have kids and they come back to religion once they have kids because they want their kids to have sort of the same moral foundation they did. But now what you're seeing is those things that used to draw people back to church are not drawing them back to church. And people are just leaving as they age now. One really surprising fact is that every birth cohort is less religious today than it was 15 years ago. So people born in the early 1950s, people born in the early 1960s, people born in the late 1970s, they're all leaving religion, but you're seeing a more wholesale leaving amongst older millennials, so people born in the early 1980s and late 1970s. Those are the kind of people you would figure would be back in religion because they have kids who are like teenagers now and youth group and all those activities, but you're not seeing that at all. 
But you're also seeing some data that says the boomers are now de-churching at a fairly rapid rate as well. And I think that's a really interesting pattern because the boomers grew up at a time pre-social media, pre-internet, where you had to have sort of face-to-face interactions with people. So it's really interesting that that generation who had, who had been you know interacting face-to-face for their entire lives are now saying, wait a minute, I don't want to be part of religion anymore. And they're actually dropping out of every aspect of American society. They're atomizing, to use a social science term. They're not going to things like the American Legion and bowling leagues and all the things Robert Putnam told us about 30 years ago. The boomers are sort of making it worse by not being part of these social groups, which used to tie them together and get no sense of community belonging. And religion is not religion specifically. It's religion as a larger current of atomization where people are just leaving social clubs, social networks, organizations behind in droves for a bunch of reasons. Yeah. yeah. And of course, the, the book is uh, Bowling Alone that he's referring to and a very, very, very well-known book. And Our Kids is the next book, which I really just I, I found fascinating. Uh, as well. Uh, let's uh, just press in a little more on the demographic question that Daniel asked too, because one of the things you just talked about here, again, we're at the Evangelism Leaders Fellowship here at the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center. Um, we're actually recording at the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center. I, got, I haven't got to say that in a long time. So, um, but one of the things that you talked about was that this is, um, you know, religion, you, you wrote an article that ticked a lot of people off on religion being a luxury good. and But I, I think a lot of people don't realize that the de-churched are often white not not i mean just because we're, we're predominantly white country but they're, they're 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 white they're more blue collar they're uh and and and, and you know I, as one who sometimes has it found that some evangelical leaders sort of dismiss some of that demographic i'm concerned about that so that's that's my heritage grew up in a union iron lathers home you know civil service family um talk to us about that explain the demographics that are going on here with de-churching yeah, I think the the biggest misconception that people have about religion is that it's full of uneducated, lower income folks who go to religion. It's sort of a Karl Marx explanation, like a salve that gets them through the worst moments of their life. And so religion's full of people with high school degrees making you know less than fifty thousand dollars a year. But if you look at the data, it's actually the exact opposite of what the perception is. The average churchgoer today, the person most likely to go to church today. Four-year college degree, make between sixty and hundred thousand dollars a year, married with children. Sort of the golden path is what economists call that. Like if you go to college and then have kids, or get married then have kids, your likelihood of having a good income goes up dramatically. Well, guess what? Your likelihood of being in church goes up dramatically. And I think a lot of that comes back to the fact that blue collar folks and lower income folks have a deep distrust of other people and institutions. And religion at its core is an institution like banks or business or government or anything else. And what they don't realize is that that religion used to be the great leveler. You know, it would I grew up in, in a poverty family. My, I was on free or reduced lunch my entire time from 11 years old up. And I can't tell you how many times I would come home and there'd be food sitting on our doorstep that people would bring from our local church to help us get through a rough patch. And I didn't know what was going on financially, but I knew we weren't doing well because of that. But I don't know how we would have survived those moments without the, that food on the doorstep. And the problem is the p- families like mine aren't in church now, and they're not getting those connections, that that connective tissue that helps lift them up in their worst moments. And I think in some ways it's making income inequality worse because the people who need the help the most are not connected to communities of people who want to help them the most. And I think church has become really one note, right, which is people with college degrees, making decent incomes, doing everything right, quote unquote, in life. And people who do anything wrong, quote unquote, don't feel welcome there because they don't check all those golden path boxes. Right. I want to ask you two two questions. One is um, uh, related to this, uh, if, and, and that is, as a pastor or a church leader, um, and you're being mindful of essentially those that are falling off, those who are either de-churched or nothing in particular, and given the demographic that you're talking about, the lesser educated um, less connected to resources um how do you how do you how do you connect with them uh and then especially those who from previous generations there was kind of the boomerang effect right you would you would get educated you would go to school have a family and then make your way back into the church and that was maybe boomers and exorcists to a certain degree i heard you saying earlier we were not seeing that with millennials as much mm-hmm. and so there seems to be a disconnect between those who have and who have not it's like there's kind of both who are either nothing in particular or de churching and as a church leader, how do I develop my programming, develop my uh, messaging in a way that can connect what seems like a very disparate to, uh, group of people? Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah. I mean, the issue here is like 
nothing in particular is are are the people you don't see, right? They don't have they don't have clubs, they don't have banners, they don't have Facebook groups. Like atheists have clubs. There's the American Atheists, the American United for Separation of Church and State, the Freedom from Religion Foundation. There's all these really well-funded, well-organized groups for atheists and agnostics to you know join together and kind of fight for their political rights or whatever. No, no one makes a club for nothing in particulars. So they're the unseen people in American society. They're 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 hard to find. So it actually creates a really hard problem for church leaders because it's like, how do you find people? who are intentionally hard to find. They've dropped out of all the aspects of American society. So there are a couple places, I think, where they've not dropped out. One is school. They still send their kids to public school, by and large. And so what's happened is local schools have had to create these old social safety nets for kids whose parents don't have a lot of connection with the outside world. So that's why they have social workers and, and speech therapists and all these kind of things. So think school. So think about a backpack drive. You know, Give kids a free backpack full of, of supplies at the start of the year. Do... Get, You've got to find ways to get them on your property in non-confrontational, non-super evangelical ways, right? Because as soon as they see that evangelical stuff, they're going to be like, wait a minute, you're trying to sell me on something. And this is, I'm not into that whole thing. You've got to show them that you're normal people. You're not weirdos. You're not trying to make them, you know, change their life radically today. All you're trying to do is lift their burdens a little bit and get them through this day in a way that makes sense to them. Once they realize that the purpose of church, one of the purposes of the church is to help the community and, you know, find the people on the margins, they're going to realize that the people here are not trying to judge. They're not trying to make your life harder. They're honestly trying to make your life easier because they're people who are equipped to serve. And a lot of people in that community have the resources to help you. So find ways to connect those nothing in particular families with your church in non-religious ways to begin with. I'm a big believer that you bring people into church for the wrong reasons and then they stay for the right reasons. So get them on the grounds. A lot of churches have huge buildings. They have huge properties. They have all the they have fellowship halls and gymnasiums. Use those resources as much as you can to bring those people in. Once they realize you're not crazy and you're not cults, they might stick around for a while and actually you know, go to worship on Sunday morning. But what do you think? Are there social institutions right now that are doing a good job messaging to this group? Not really. That's the problem is no, no one's coming into American life and saying, listen, don't be afraid of your. And if you if someone comes, don't be afraid of other people. They're gonna be like, wait, I'm afraid of you now. What are you trying to sell me? People are deeply skeptical of what's happening here. And America does not have a robust social safety net. You know, we're not we're not Denmark or Sweden. So what I worry about is if they're not these, this group of people is not being served by the church. They're also not being served by the government that well either. And they're really falling behind. If you look at their, their level of education, for instance, nothing in particular, they've actually, their education has increased lower than the national average over the last 15 years. So not only are they behind, they're falling further behind every year now. And that leads to all kinds of feelings of hopelessness and helplessness. And that makes them harder to move up the economic ladder. And everyone wants their kids to do better than they did. And I think amongst this group, there's a strong sense that they don't feel that way, that their kids are going to be worse off than they were, and they're worse off than their grandparents were. So um, one of the things you talked about, again, we're, we're here at the Wheaton College Building Ram Center, and you talked about why people come back. And I think uh, people are interested in why people come back, and you kept coming back to one simple word. And it's more than that, but this is the one that comes to the top. So talk to us a little bit about why people come back. Friends, 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 friends. That's the answer. Like it, it really is. If you so when we did the de-churching book, we asked people like, what would bring you back? And then we listed the top four for every type of de-churched evangelical. And friends were at least two of the top four reasons for every one of the four clusters. Friends, my friend, if my friends are there, I'll go back. And that creates a huge chicken and egg problem, right? Because it's like how to get people in there if they have no friends to start with in that church. But what you've got to realize is people don't want to feel like they're left out. They're socially outcast. No one wants to go to a, a barbecue and sit at a table by themselves. They want to go and hang out with their friends. So what you've got to figure out is get that first couple or that first family or those first two or three families together and then figure out how they can add to that number. I heard a, an evangelist say one time, if you want to start a new church, you just find people that are already friends and then build a church on top of that right? Start with a social connection. And that's what grows more people to come to that group. So I was uh, on the drive here. I stopped at a, a gas station, had a subway in it. There were like 12 old people sitting around a table at subway talking with each other. And I was thinking they're in some weird way having church right now. Like they're making, making social connection. That's what people want. 
And religion used to provide that. And for a lot of people, it doesn't anymore. So they're seeking it out by sitting at McDonald's, drinking coffee for three hours in the morning. People need friends. They want social connection. And we cannot discount the fact that while while church is about, you know, Jesus and salvation, all those eternal things, it's also about temporal things like making connections and making friends. Hmm. Ryan, let's let's pull back a little bit. And, uh, you know, a lot of your work is uh, you look at stats for big, huge trends and, um, if we go back to 1950, I mean, that might, you know, if there's a, go to, a golden era of American Christianity, that might be it. Um, but is the sky really falling when it comes to evangelicalism, when it comes to Christianity in, in America, when it comes to religion in general? What is the state of it? Uh, what does the landscape of religion look like in the U.S.? Yeah, so I think what's interesting about calling the 50s the golden age of religion is it was the golden age because most of Americans were mainline Protestant. Over half of Americans were mainline Protestant in 1952, 55% almost. And now that share has dropped from 55% to 10% of Americans are mainline Protestant. And there's a very good chance it's going to be 5% in the next 15 years because the average mainline Protestant now is over the age of 60 years old. So mainline Protestant Christianity has absolutely collapsed over the last 75 years. Now, evangelical. Now, I want to disrupt you. So, you got to just for context, main lines yeah. like United Church of Christ, Episcopal yeah. Church, American Baptist, things of that sort. Okay, more of the progressive, older denominations. Exactly. Yeah. They, then they used to dominate every aspect of American society, right. politics, and, culture. and they're in the in the fifties. They they believed a lot more, like in some ways, like evangelicals believe today. Not in everything, but they were more conservative theologically, that kind of stuff. Yeah. But on the other hand, evangelicals. There's actually probably more evangelicals in America today than there were in the 1970s. True. Share of Americans are evangelical is about 21, 22 percent, depending on how you, you know, how you use the classification. But the share of Americans who self-identify as evangelical or born again is the same today as it was in 2008. Um, evangelicalism is doing quite fine. Thank you. Like it is it is not declining at nearly the rate the mainline is. And even Catholicism has seen a few point decline in the last 10 years. So now they're down to around 20 percent. And what's interesting about Catholicism is the share of Catholics who go to Mass every Sunday was 50% in the 1970s. It's 25% today. Mm -hmm. So that top number has only declined a little bit, but underneath the surface, Mass attending Catholics has declined precipitously. So the main line's down big time. Evangelical, the share of evangelicals who go to church every Sunday has actually gone up. Okay, now we should be clear that that Ryan's not an evangelical, just to throw that out there. Um, <laughs> well, because sometimes people might say, I mean, you're in a mainline Protestant church, and yes. you're, you know, you've got a, you can have some evangelical tendencies. But I, I think when I say that, people are like, well, Ed Stetzer's an evangelical; he's protecting the brand. Uh, so it's probably helpful when you say that it's not so much that. And I should tell you too, just for fun fact that Daniel Yang doesn't know. Uh, Ryan and I actually published an article together in the Journal of Politics and Religion. That's right. Um, on the broken rel trad coding that analyzed the percentage of people that were evangelicals in the United States over a, a chunk of time that was broken. And we, we kind of pointed that out. So just a fun, a fun extra bonus fact. When we talk about evangelicals from 1972, that's because the general social survey has been the, the tool that we've used to track that. Okay, so, so big picture then. Uh, mainline Protestantism, you would use the word collapse. You, yep. um, uh, Catholic in trouble, uh, you, evangelical, uh, you use your term just fine. I mean, there's, I, I would say, depending on what tool we're using, um, you know, I, I would say there's definitely some cause for concern. You have some concerns. You talk about those elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, Black Protestants, the fourth category we talk mm-hmm. about. What would you put there? Uh, so they're declining, but very slowly. They were 8% of America in the 1970s. Now they're about 5 or 6% of America today. Um, interesting fact about African Americans: when they leave religion, they do not become atheists or agnostics. Um, for for white people, it's about uh, uh, of the nuns, white nuns, twenty percent are atheists and twenty percent are agnostic, uh, and only sixty percent are nothing in particular. Amongst African Americans who are nuns, ninety percent of them are nothing in particular. So when black people leave religion behind, they don't go that far. They don't go to the atheist agnostic thing like white people do. They really stick in that nothing in particular category. But the, the largest, you know, the historically black churches like the uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, the Church of God in Christ, they're seeing pretty noticeable declines in their membership. And um, they're, they're smaller. I mean, there are only a couple, two, three million people in those in those traditions today. So there's a good chance that they will continue to decline as younger generations of African-Americans are leaving religion at the same rate, by the way, as white Americans. So they're not insulated from the larger trend towards the nuns. 
Okay, so so we've got for just for you know, there's kind of four big categories in American religion, just so people are aware: mainline Protestant, evangelical, Black Protestant, and Catholic. And so yep. that's kind of the the, the big the big buckets. Um, so, but looking kind of at the the I guess from the the big buckets. I mean, with all these interviews we're doing with Faithlytics, and again, people can go to uh, remember glue.us slash Faithlytics. You might even be watching this on there, but that's where all the video ones are. And I've, so I've talked a lot to Frank Newport at Gallup, and, and you know, they, they say maybe there's a leveling off of the rise of the nuns, but they're kind of the only ones who are seeing that, so we'll see. Uh, not all research always agrees. It takes a few years to look back and see what was right. But I think every one of the interviews we talked about the nuns. Now, you wrote a book on the nuns. So if the nuns are now growing one to two percent a year, PRI sometimes has a little higher than everybody else. Um, that's a research firm. So where are these nuns coming from? Are they coming from the ranks of blank? So a lot of a lot of Catholics become nuns. Um, actually, that's one of the most significant pipelines is the born Catholic adult nun now. Yeah, I didn't. I should. I should have said. It, but I didn't explain. Nun is none of the above on religion. It's not the nice ladies with hats. Um, but. <laughs> Yeah. But so so none of that is anything about. So yes, and that's most of my family. Just what you just described is most of my family were Catholic, and yep. now they're nuns. Okay, keep yep. going. So, uh, but a lot of them are being raised nuns now. That's like a new phenomenon. If you look back at people born in the 1950s, only four percent of them said they were raised without religion, and now about 20 percent of young people say they were raised without religion. So that's become a huge pipeline. Is people who are, and it used to be back in the day in the 1970s. Only one third of people raised without religion had no religion as adults. So one third retention rate. Now it's two thirds retention rate. So two thirds of people who are born nuns are now nuns as adults. And that's climbing over the last five decades. So they're stick that their their nuns are not leaving for religion now. They're staying nuns into adulthood at higher rates. So that creates this if a religion wants to grow or even stay stable, retention is the easiest way to do that. You know, the Latter-day Saints send out missionaries all over the world, you know, for a two-year mission. They're lucky if they convert one or two people during that two-year time. Retention is way easier than, than conversion and evangelism. So I think that's how the nuns are actually growing is by retaining their own people. We're seeing some evangelical defection, but not a ton. Uh, mainline defection is going up, obviously, because they got to go somewhere. Where are they going to go? You know, there's no mainline churches left. So it's really, I think, the Catholic the main line, a little evangelical, but a lot of people being raised with no religion are now sticking with no religion into adulthood. So Ryan, throw into that now um, a couple of categories. So uh, again, when we're talking about decline, we're usually talking about the share of population, but throw in there now uh, the trends in marriage Mm -hmm. and family. So how is that impacting how we retain uh, religion um, across the board for, for Christians? And then other things like birth rates and uh, immigration, how's that impacting these numbers? Yeah, so here's a, here's a staggering statistic. In, uh, in 2022, a 40-year-old woman is twice as likely to say they've never been married as a 40-year-old woman was to say in 2008. It's gone from 13% never married by their, by their 40th birthday to 26% never married by their 40th birthday. And amongst men, it's almost, it's almost doubled, not quite double. So marriage is really, dr- I mean, in, in a short period of time, 14 years is not that long in terms of our, you know, our history. So marriage as an institution has really collapsed over the last 10 or 15 years. It's something that people just don't do anymore. Obviously, it's concentrated more amongst Democrats and liberals and conservatives, but it's affecting everyone. The number of people who are having children now is, is the lowest it's ever been. I think birth rate is something we don't talk about enough. People should be having kids. But for instance, of atheists at 40 years old are parents. Only 40% of atheists at 40 years old are parents. They're not having kids. So that's a major problem. If a religion wants to grow, having kids and keeping those kids in a religion is a key way to do that. Yeah, of course, the, the dropouts, there's always kind of dropout stuff. There's this one stat that went all over the place. Uh, 86% of evangelical youth drop out of church after high school, never to return. And of course, any time research has the word never in it, you know that they made it up because you can't track never. Um, so what, I mean, again, the, the D church book doesn't get at this and nuns book doesn't get at this, but you have inter intersected with that around this. If you, we want to keep the next generation, what does it look like? How are we doing with keeping the next generation and what is it different in different streams of the Christian tradition? 
Yeah, so the, it, it, I asked someone asked me to do some analysis on young mainliners the other day in the GSS. I didn't have enough to even do the analysis. Yeah, GSS is General Social Survey, so yeah. people know. And then we'll be using the RELTRAD to do the analysis of the GSS. And if you want to learn more about the RELTRAD, there's an article that Ryan and I wrote. But anyway, that's a very niche, very niche article. No one will ever find. But anyway. This is Ed's super nerdy credibility on the line right here. He it is. Well, I got the I got the nerd, the whole nerd side of me that the podcast listeners don't get to enjoy. But all right, so so keep going. You, you tried yeah. to do this on young mainliners. There's not enough young mainliners in the general to even do any statistical analysis anymore. Like it's it's they're almost like the, it's like the dodo bird. They're going to go extinct in the next 10 or 15 years. Like they they just don't exist. Yeah, I, wrote, this, I, wrote an, I wrote an article for The Washington Post. I said, uh, if current trends continue, mainline Protestants have 23 Easter's left. And I just kind of tracked the general social survey and it got some people mad, but it also hopefully let people see those numbers are, are headed down. But OK, keep going across the other traditions. Yeah. So um, mainliners don't exist anymore. Okay, uh, evangelicals are actually really good at retaining their own. Um, they're actually the best of any religious group. So about seventy-five percent of kids who are raised evangelical stay evangelical into adulthood. Now it used to be eighty percent. So there has been a little bit of erosion there, but seventy-five percent amongst mainliners, it's fifty-five percent. Amongst Catholics, it's sixty percent. So comparatively, evangelicals are doing a very good job of keeping their own. But right, the highest, the highest, probably wonder the highest is Mormons. Actually, High, Mormons do the highest of any group. So yeah, but the problem with Mormon, it's sticky. Mormonism yeah. as an idea is stickier than Protestantism because people yeah, don't. Sure. It's really hard to leave the Latter Day Saint Church. By the way, like you have to. No, it is because so culturally connected, and also too, just so we're clear, we're not putting that in the same category as a Christian tradition or different context. But yeah, exactly. Um, so. I think there's a couple things that we need to think about. One is sending your kids away to college is not a guarantee they'll leave religion behind. Actually, the opposite is true. The people who are the most likely to go to church this Sunday are people with a postgraduate degree. People who are least likely are those without a high school diploma. So, you know, sending people away to college is not some like it's this is not a God's not dead thing. The data does not back up that idea that your philosophy professor is going to turn your kids away from Jesus. That just does not happen. Um, so, but they also need to stay connected to two things. They need to be part of a church that regularly they go to during college. That's really important. And they also need to be part of some type of Christian ministry, right? Whether it be crew or some sort of parachurch ministry. If you, if those two things happen, that young person is much more likely to stay evangelical at 25 years old than someone who doesn't do either of those two things. So send them wherever you want, private, public, Obviously, you can send to Biola, you know, you can go to Wheaton, all those places. <laughs> not that those are not that those are, you know, the only options that are out there, but those are good options. Let me mention too, one of the things when, when Ryan talks and he says that doesn't happen, he's talking yeah. about general terms. Certainly yeah. there's some student who went off in a philosophy press or convinced them otherwise. When he said African Americans don't do this, he's talking about general terms. Yes. That's what researchers do. But it is, I mean, there is a bit of a myth out there, Ryan that there's this huge deconstruction pathway. And I want to ask one more question about that. Because mm -hmm. one of the things you said, again, we're, we're here at the Evangelical Leaders Fellowship at the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center. You kind of talked about ex-evangelicals and the people who dropped out. And, and I think um, you kind of wanted to say that maybe the volume online is not representative of the experience of most people. Talk to us about that. Yeah. So we asked people on a survey, uh, are you currently evangelical? And they say yes or no. Then we ask them, at any point in your life, would you consider yourself to be evangelical? Yes or no? And the share of Americans who are ex-evangelical, meaning they used to be evangelical and today aren't evangelical, is about 3%, right? So it's a group that is, listen, let's not marginalize them. That 3% is not a not insignificant number of Americans, but they're a very small slice of what America is. 22% of Americans are still evangelical. So the vast majority of people who are raised evangelical are still evangelical today. And something really interesting from the great de-churching is a significant number, a third of ex-evangelicals in our, our data set who are ex-evangelicals were retired people. We don't talk about well, that very much. I you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. not monolithic, it's not monolithic but, but I do think it's worth noting that, and you're right, you're right to say, I mean, we want to be aware there are people who have left all kinds of different traditions. There are people who are ex-Mormons and ex-Catholics and ex-Buddhists, ex and, and, and some people are left mad and unhappy. Um, and, and I think we should address some of those concerns and engage them. But most people who leave are not becoming uh, militant, um, you know, anti event, you know, a lot of our listeners are evangelical, but they're not becoming that they're becoming something else. What, 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 what is that? Blah. I Blah. think meh. Meh, yeah, meh is like the key phrase in the 20, 2023 <laughs> about yeah. religion. The nothing yeah. in particular, you know what they are about religion? Meh. 
a lot of people who leave religion behind are man, they don't hate religion, right? They're not in, they're not writing books about how much religion hurt them or trauma or any of that stuff. They're leaving just because it doesn't really do anything for them. And they had, you know, they have other priorities and they shift and they did something else. They got divorced, they got married, they had kids, and they just don't come back. They don't have antipathy towards religion. They really don't feel that much toward religion at all. We ask people, you know, aspirational questions. Like if you went back, would you have a better social life? Would you have a better spiritual health, mental health? And a lot of people are sort of on the fence of that, about that too. It's not like they're asper- They're like, oh, I really wish I felt better and I'm just not going to church where I knew I would feel better. They're not even convinced that they'll feel better if they go back to religion either. So they're really just ambivalent about the topic of religion. They're not strongly for or against. So Ryan, before we wrap up here, I want I want to get your thoughts and reflections on, uh, you know, last year Pew put out four, four to eight scenarios of where uh, American Christianity is going to be by 2070. And if you remember what they put out, uh, there was no scenario where uh, Christianity was going to see a growth trajectory in terms of uh, share of the population. Um, It's easy to see that and uh, see that as um, disheartening or feeding the decline narrative. What are different ways that we can think about that? Uh, We're seeing, again, they project out potential four to eight different scenarios. But if you look at them, none of them show up into the right. All of them are uh, you know, right into the bottom. Yeah, and let me mention too, if I could, Dan, before we finish that question, we do talk about that too in the Faithlytic series with Greg Smith from Pew. So go ahead, go ahead and keep going, Dan. I just wanted to remind people, go to glue.us slash faithlytic. Yeah, I, if you can just help uh, pastors and church leaders think about that in a way that's beyond just the uh, sky is falling narrative or decline narrative, what? how can we think better about that? Yeah, so there's this concept in social science called social desirability bias which is the just the idea that people lie to you on surveys about certain things, right? So uh, drug use, sexual partners, and church, like religious stuff, they lie about a lot. So actually part of what might be driving that decline is now people used to lie about what they were religiously 30 years ago and aren't lying about it today. They're being honest. They're saying they're nothing in particular. When really they were nothing in particular 20 years ago, they just didn't want to look at another human being and say that because of the social stigma attached to that. So maybe what's driving that, what's actually we're seeing is things are being revealed. Things aren't changing as much as they're just being revealed for what they really were 20 or 30 years ago. And we might never have been as religious as we thought that we were. So from that perspective, really, it's kind of like the first step in Alcoholics Anonymous is recognizing you have a problem. And and now the problem is becoming surfaced in a way that it wasn't 20 or 30 years ago as a survey design and the change of social stigma. Listen, there is, I don't see a scenario at, at all statistically where there are a larger share of Christians in America in 30 years than there are today. I just don't, you cannot get there. Now, what what you're going to have left, though, is the people who are left are the people who are really committed to the cause of Christianity. You know, it's like a, I I make the analysis, like a a reduction sauce on a stove. You put a lot of liquid in and with some spices and things, and you let it cook down over time. And the amount of liquid goes down, but the, 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 the taste of that liquid goes up, the strength of the liquid goes up. I think that's what's happening in Christianity right now. A lot of that, those people are being boiled off for whatever reason. Whoever's going to be left are going to be really, really committed people. And that number of Christians is going to drop pretty pretty quickly, and then it's going to stop dropping because that, that concentration is going to be there for a long, long time. You've been listening to Dr. Ryan Burst. Uh, be sure to check out his books, The Nuns, 20 Myths About Religion, Politics in America, and The Great Dechurching. You can learn more about Ryan at ryanburch.net. Also, be sure to go to glue.us slash faithlytics for five other conversations on data, church, and the future. Thanks again for listening to the Sets of Church Leaders podcast. You can find more interviews as well as other great content for ministry leaders at churchleaders.com slash podcast. And again, if you found our conversation today helpful, love for you to take a few moments, leave us a review that help other ministry leader, leaders find and benefit Spotify. from our content. Particularly on Check Spotify. Check us out on Spotify and leave <laughs> us a review. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you in the next episode. You've been listening to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast. For more great interviews, as well as articles, videos, and free resources, visit our website at churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening. Technology is moving so fast, it's hard for many churches and nonprofits to keep up, especially when it comes to giving. So stay ahead of the curve with Secure Gives 7-in-1 Giving System with all the new features like Auto Card Updater, Cryptocurrency Giving, and Tap to Give Kiosks with Apple Pay. It's the system that's proven to engage more people in giving. 
And it's all backed with their full suite of management tools that enable you to gain insight into your church's giving at a glance. But Secure Giving is more than a tech company. It's a partner in growing giving and engagement. They believe every church should be fully funded and they want to help you make that happen. Empower people to support your church's mission through Secure Give's seamless, integrated, all-in-one giving technology. Visit securegive.com slash Stetzer today to get six months of free software to see why Secure Give is the trusted giving solution. Again, six months of free software when you go to securegive.com slash Stetzer to get started.